Thank you. Um, well, thank you, last John Corla. Um, I welcome the opportunity to speak on this um, report. Um, I know the last time was um, the 14th of May, I think, and there's been some events of. Uh, deferred it a couple of times, but just to say at the outset that um, I was chairman of the committee, as it was known then as Commun Communications, Energy, and Natural Resources and Agriculture Committee. And I see two of my colleagues, uh, Deputy uh, um, Ferris and Pringle, uh, here with me uh, in, in the chamber this evening. Um, the reason we set about doing the report in the first place was that there was a lot of recent media, media going back over the last number of years about um, the energy, uh, the resources and the way they were being allegedly uh, abused and taken from the public good in the West of Ireland made doing such a report um, a timely matter for us and we felt it was important to try and establish the facts um, and, and separate out fact from fiction and dispel some myths. One of the words um, that kept being used at the time was the estimated amount of oil and gas reserves in Irish territory was um, usually quantified in millions and billions um, but it hadn't been found and we had given it all away so we set about our job we took um, hearings, we had hearings from several key stakeholders um, people who are, in, who are involved in oil exploration, people from um, the communities in, that had felt the brunt of what they felt was unfair practices and had been exploited and from um, other jurisdictions in particular Norway who will have to acknowledge their help the Norwegian ministry and the Norwegian indeed the ambassador here um, <clears throat> so what did we find well first of all we found that by comparison with other um, countries namely Norway and the UK, the amount of exploration in the first place that had taken place in Ireland over the last 40 years was minuscule. Um, and if you don't look for something, you won't find it. And we had to ask the question, what was the reason that people weren't looking um, for or weren't as inclined to carry out exploration in, in, in Irish waters? If it was the case that our we were going to give it all away then you would, it would seem that that wasn't a reason why and the main reason was that nobody had found it, it wasn't seen to be as viable or as easy to um, as profitable to actually establish and take the risk of exploring for oil and gas and natural resources off the Irish coast in particular um, we then set about identifying the key uh, priorities and followed up with recommendations. I think we based our recommendations just to make um, very quickly on what Article 10 of Bunrock Naharan states that all natural resources including the air and all forms of potential air energy within the jurisdiction of the Parliament and Government established by this Constitution and all royalties and franchises within that jurisdiction belong to the state subject to all the states and interests therein and for the time being lawfully vested in any person or body. In other words the resources of the state are, the, are for the benefit of the people of the state. On the other hand, it is very expensive to carry out exploration, um, uh, especially in challenging territories such as we, where the, the most um, potential seems to lie off the west and northwest coasts of this country. And it would be folly for Ireland, uh, even if we were flush with um, resources, to actually engage in exploration. Rather, it was better to um, try and tap into the potential um, by way of, of a, a suitable tax regime on foot of um, any fines that might be discovered. And for that purposes, we set about looking at what was in place. And w we do acknowledge that in 2007, the previous government brought in a different regime to the one that had caused so much of the grief. And that was uh, following on an Indicon report um, whereby a profit resource rent tax or PRRT was established with a scale of taxation um, based on the relative prof profitability of each, each field. Um, basically it added 5%, um, 10% and up to 15% on top of corporation tax for any company um, if the profit ratios went in excess of 1.5 to 1 
3 to 1 and 4 and a half to 1. What we simply said was, and this is probably the thing that, well, we knew it would cause the most uh, stir, but maybe that was deliberate to get people thinking. What we said was that at, at the, in between each offer of licensing rounds, there should be a review carried out and basically that review should examine what had happened with the previous round of exploration. Had any significant viable discoveries been made and if so what was the likelihood of another on the next round of more of them being found and if it was the case that it was felt that more and more um, uh, viable discoveries would be made that we could look at upping the rate that the government would take for, on behalf of the people by way of increased profit resource rent tax. The figures of 40, 60 and 80 became the popular um, uh, figures that were thrown out and yes that is what it would amount to in very profitable fields. I know the Minister in his, in his statement at the start said maybe the committee were, were indicating that that's what we should go aim towards in the event of you know is having a level of, of um, activity similar and discovery similar to that in, in some of our neighbours and that is exactly what we meant. This report is a template. It, it has quite a deal of statistical evidence and factual evidence assembled. It does state that in the event after each round on review that if um, it's felt that companies would be prepared to come in because the risk is decreased and the chances of, of having viable of discoveries are, are increased then they should be prepared to pay more to the state and we feel that that's fair and reasonable it works in other countries a couple of things one is that whatever um, arrangements are made should be stuck to um, and if somebody is fortunate enough um, to make a discovery um, with a, a regime that maybe if, if it hadn't have been uh, quite so soon might have been higher well then that's, that's their good fortune. The Ecofisk field in Norway was discovered um, one week, Christmas Eve 1967 I think, um, one week before a three year exploration license had, was due to expire. That became known as the mother load for, um, for the Norwegian economy and uh, the Norwegian um, oil and exploration industry on which the economy has benefited massively ever since. Two minutes remain. We're not saying, last count Corla, <coughs> that we should adopt a Norwegian rate of tax without Norwegian levels of discovery. We're simply saying that as if and when this estimated potential becomes more and more realizable, that we should look on every review of exploration licenses, on each, on each, in each round of exploration licenses, I think at the levels of tax that we're actually charging. One basic principle, however, is that under the current system, tax doesn't, a profit resource rent tax doesn't actually become chargeable until the profit ratio increases by to one point, becomes greater than 1.5 to 1. We are saying that as soon as a profit um, happens at all, there should be tax on that by means of the profit resource rent tax because corporation tax is not directly linked to discoveries in the field. So companies, in other words, could have other activities in the country and their corporation tax need not necessarily be as high as it might be um, for, for various different reasons because of write-offs, etc. So what we're saying is when a, when a field becomes viable or profitable, there should be some level of tax from the moment that it becomes profitable. I think that's not unfair um, and this PRRT structure is such that all the accumulated costs are offset every year for as long as the activity takes place and we, we as a committee decided not to interfere or tamper with that. Could I finally, last Count Corla, thank and acknowledge the um, assistance um, and, and wholehearted co cooperation by all members of the committee, all parties and none. Um, I think what we did was uh, very worthwhile. It's on the record. We, we welcome an opportunity, all of us, I think, to, to have our say on it. Much has been said. I had a letter in today's Irish Times correct, correcting an article where <laughs> I'm sure the Minister would be flattered that he was, he was um, identified as having appointed our committee. And I'm sure he'd be even more flattered to know that people in some other parts, the commentators, think that he had absolute influence over all the spokesmen on the opposition benches <laughs> and um, that he was 
of such um, influence that we were actually prepared to go along and make a report and, and say do nothing. What we simply said was that you should not go back and, and retrospectively change the law because that doesn't help for certainty. Um, I think that was misinterpreted. Maybe it was in, in the way that uh, the author um, translated the report. I'm not quite sure, but certainly that wasn't our intention. So that's Ken Paula. Could I once again thank you and welcome the opportunity to speak on it. I think I would recommend that this report is used for reference. There is a lot of useful information assembled. It wasn't, um, there's more than one recommendation, there's 11 based on five key themes. I think it should be looked at in, the, in, the, in its entirety, not just simply um, on one sim single re recommendation. Thank you, Deputy. I'll call Deputy John Brown.